What's going on here? Some guy with trousers too small for him is picking up leaves at a public park in the autumn, keeping everything neat and tidy. Well, well, who do we have here? It's Dr. Zakir Naik, one of Islam's top proselytizers and adored by millions of easily impressionable Muslims. He makes claims that the Quran is scientific and therefore can only be explained as a book with divine authorship. In this clip here, he is asking Muslims to give their zakat to his TV channel so he can proselytize and spread what he calls the solution to humanity. Zakat is Muslim charity that usually goes to the poor and needy, but I'm sure God doesn't mind it going to line this man's pockets instead so he can make more people Muslims. I often get asked by Muslims I debate who cannot read up my arguments to watch his videos as they consider him to be one of their most knowledgeable televangelists. The topic of this video is... How to do dawah to an atheist? So I decided to listen to him and see whether he can finally convince me that I need to repent and return to Islam. Let's get going. Most of the atheists we realize have become atheists because they believe in science and technology. These people think that science has advanced so much, we don't require any scripture, we don't require any religion, etc. The first question I ask to the atheist is, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a machinery, which no one in the world has ever seen before. If it's bought in front of you, if it's bought in front of the atheist, and if we ask the question to him, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this machinery, or this object, what can be his reply? What can he reply? Suppose a machinery who no one in the world has seen, if it's bought in front of the atheist, and he's asked the question, who will be the first person who will tell you the mechanism of this machinery or object? The reply the atheist will give you is the first person who will tell you the mechanism is the manufacturer. Well, personally, if I had bought a new device, I will inspect it closely and possibly use trial and error to see how it works. But the analogy you give us here only works if you consider that there is more than one manual. The Hindus give me a manual and tell me it's from the inventor of the machine. The Scientologists say the Hindus are lying and only they have the original manual from the machine inventor. The Mormons, the Muslims, the Sikhs and so on all claim to be the only ones with the real manual. I have a lot of manuals and I need to decide whether any of them is a genuine manual for this machine. Since they all contradict each other, only one can be correct. But there is also a strong chance, since so many people are lying about this manual, that none of them are correct and no one has ever met or spoken to the person who made the machine. I look into all the manuals and if they are referring to components which do not appear on this model, or if they order me to put my hand in near sharp moving mechanisms, I will not go along with the manual and conclude it's not the genuine manual. In the end, I may just have to figure out how to use this machine using common sense and trial and error. Then ask him the next question. That how did our universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell us that initially there was a primary nebula. Then there was a big bang. There was a secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies, the sun, the moon and the earth on which we live. This we call as a big bang. When did you come to know about this creation of the universe? So he will tell you, about 30-40 years back, the scientists discovered this. You ask him the question, but what you are talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see, Anna samawati wal arda, kanat ratkan huma, that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you are talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So the atheist will say, maybe it's the fluke. No problem. Don't argue with him. You continue. No, I wouldn't say it was a fluke at all. I would tell you that you are either being dishonest in your preaching, or you don't understand the scientific theory of the Big Bang. See, the verse you quoted is saying the earth and the heavens were together and then separated. Since the earth only began existing 9 billion years after the Big Bang, your verse is clearly not referring to the Big Bang. A more sensible explanation of the origin of that verse is that Islam borrowed mythology from the ancient religion of the Sumerians. 
In that faith, the heavens and the earth were together, but then separated by a god named Enlil. Incidentally, this Enlil god also ordered a global flood when he was fed up with humans. Okay, Dr. Nayak, what other scientific miracle do you have from the Quran? The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So the atheist will tell us that previously we thought the moon has its own light. Recently we have come to know in science, recently means 100 years back, 200 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but a reflected light. The Quran mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who had placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein a lamp, a sun, having its own light and moon having reflected light or borrowed light. The Arabic word used for moonlight in the Quran is munir or nur, meaning reflected light or borrowed light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon is not its own light but reflected light which we have come to know recently? The atheist may say, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, maybe he was an intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Continue. Okay, I'm beginning to notice a pattern here. You are clearly lying once again. You claim no one knew the moon's light was reflected back then. Well, Aristarchus of Samos knew the moon was reflecting the sun's light nearly a thousand years before Muhammad was even born. So this is not information we have only known for a hundred or two hundred years as you claim. But I'm not going to be too tough on you for being ignorant of scientific history when speaking about the subject. Moving on to your claim that this is mentioned in the Quran, again, it's not mentioned in the Quran. I can't believe you have the nerve to pretend that the word nur in Arabic means reflected light or borrowed light. It most certainly does not. Nur means light, plain and simple. The word nur or manir appears 39 times in the Quran and I list all references in the description below. I challenge anyone to find a verse using the word nur to clearly mean reflected light. Nowhere at all does it appear to be talking about reflected light. Let's read a couple of verses with the word nur in them and see whether your definition of the word makes sense. Allah is the guardian of those who believe. He brings them out of the darkness into the reflected light. They desire to put out the reflected light of Allah with their mouths. Allah is the reflected light of the heavens and the earth. Chapter 24 in the Quran is also called Surah An-Nur. Show me any Quran which calls this chapter the chapter of reflected light. On top of all that, we have this verse in Surah Al-Qiyamah, chapter 75, verse 8 telling us the moon will lose its own light on Judgment Day. I've looked at all the major Sunni exegeses, Ibn Kathir, Jalalain, At-Tabari, and Tanwir al-Nakhbas, and all of them say clearly that the moon has its own light extinguished. No reference at all to reflected light. The world that we live on, what's the shape of this earth on which we live? The atheist will tell you it is spherical. When did we come to know? So he will tell us, 19, it was 1597 when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, that he proved that the earth was spherical. But the Quran says 1400 years ago, in Surah Naziat, chapter 79, verse number 30, Wal arda baada zalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg, it refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the world is not completely round like a ball, but it is geospherical in shape, it is starting from the pole. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Who could have mentioned 400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? Again, the atheist may say, you know, your prophet, maybe he was super intelligent. Don't argue with him, you can continue. Once again, you are way off with historical dates of discovery. Our friend Aristarchus of Samos knew the earth was spherical nearly a thousand years before Muhammad was born, but he wasn't the first. Aristotle knew earth's shape before him, and there are indications that Pythagoras, who died over a thousand years before Muhammad existed, was the first to understand the earth's shape. Aristarchus observed the earth's shape by looking at a number of lunar eclipses and seeing earth's round shadow cast onto the moon's surface. But another Greek scientist, Eratosthenes, who lived about 850 years before Muhammad existed, not only knew the earth was spherical, but measured the circumference of the earth using the sun's shadow at noon in two nearby Egyptian cities, and then calculated the distance between them. He was accurate to the true figure we know today to roughly 1%, which is astonishing. 
I'd say that is far more impressive than someone 800 years later saying it was egg-shaped. But again, did Muhammad actually say the earth was egg-shaped, or is Dr. Nayak making up the Arabic language as he goes along? Well, the Quran clearly states the earth is flat, like a carpet, or a wide expanse in 18 Quranic verses. Zakir Nayak ignores all these verses, then goes to one verse where he claims there may be two meanings for the word, and one of them is ostrich egg. Let's see if the haha actually means what Zakaniah claims. Al-Tabari's exegesis, one of the most thorough in Islamic history, cites 18 different hadiths relating to an explanation of the verse. Not a single hadith says it means the earth is spherical. If you actually understood Arabic, you'll know the haha means extending. It isn't even the name for an ostrich egg. The only reason it's mildly associated is because an ostrich produces an expanse with a small bit of the ground where it lays its eggs. So even with this meaning, the word is referring to the place where an ostrich egg is laid and has nothing to do with the egg itself. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun was stationary. It revolved but did not rotate about its own axis. You learned the sun revolved and did not rotate around its own axis? Well, Galileo discovered the sun rotates around its own axis in the 1600s, so you definitely went to a bad school. Uh, I think that kind of explains a lot. So they say, they say, is that mentioned in the Quran? I say, no, that is what I learned in school. When I passed my school in 1982, approximately 12 years back, I had learned the sun was stationary, did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it is Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that besides the sun revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheists will be silent. There will be a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. The verse you just cited makes absolutely no mention of the sun spinning on its own axis. Not a single exegesis in Islam makes this claim either. The Quran is clearly geocentric. Idiotic, yet honest clerics who don't try to change the meaning of verses in the Quran agree. Allah يقول والشمس تجري بمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم فالمؤمن يؤمن بما دل القرآن عليه ويصدق بذلك ويدعو التعمق والتكلف فالنص القرآن صريح في جريانها كما أخبر الشمس تجري مستقر لها فيؤمن بالقرآن ويصدق به ولا يتبع سوى في الآية الكريمة يقول استفسر عن هذه الآية والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم هل الشمس تدور حول الأرض بلا شك هذا هو ما دل عليه القرآن والشمس تجري هم يقولون لا الشمس واقفة والأرض هي اللي تجري هذا عكس ما جاء في القرآن وإبراهيم عليه السلام قال للنمرود إن الله يأتي بالشمس من المشرق فأتي بها من المغرب فبهت الذي كفر فكوننا نترك ما دل عليه القرآن ونأخذ بالنظريات الحديثة هذا لا, لا يكون من المسلم Today, science tells us that the universe is expanding, which is mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47. Here, Zakir Naik is actually right. He's honest. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. The way he makes this claim is by changing the Arabic word in the Quran to mean something entirely different to the original. This is evident once again if you look at all translations pre-1920s and when Hubble and science made this discovery, and not the Muslims for some reason, which would be a surprise if they genuinely had this verse in their book to give them such a big clue. However, what occurs here is a subtle change to the Arabic word Musi'un into Muwassi'un. The original says God created the heavens and he is surely capable of doing so. When it's changed, it can mean wide expanse or extending. It's a subtle change to the original word, but conveniently changes its meaning to try and deceive. The Quran speaks about the water cycle which we learned in school. It was Soban and Palestine in 1580 who first described the water cycle, how the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down as rain. This water cycle is spoken about in great detail in the Quran in several verses. In 
Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 24. In Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse 48 to 49. In Surah Fatih, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. There are hundreds of verses in the Quran which only speak about the water cycle which science has discovered recently. In case those verses were too quick, let's just check a couple of them out. One here seems entirely irrelevant to water altogether. It doesn't actually mention anything related to water. And this one here is probably the most detailed out of the bunch. As you can see, it's certainly not miraculous knowledge. The ancient Greeks knew a lot more about the water cycle, and even the Bible has verses that are more accurate, like this one. You can go on talking about the scientific points. There are more than a thousand verses in the Quran which speak about science. After every scientific fact, you ask the question, who could have mentioned that in the Quran? The only reply the atheist can give you is the creator, the, the cherisher, the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. That's the reason Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, said, little knowledge of science takes you away from Almighty God. In-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. That's the reason today scientists are not eliminating God, they're eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, even that is wrong. As I've just shown, you clearly have little knowledge of science, yet you are not an atheist. You are on the religion of your forefathers and use plain lies and deceit to try and reinforce your own confirmation bias and that of others, while at the same time misleading non-Muslims who may not be familiar with your tactics and unwittingly assume that you are credible. I'm hoping I've made clear that you should stop citing these examples as miracles of the Quran's divinity. You only make yourself look silly, but I guess in the end, credibility isn't a concern of yours as long as the money keeps rolling in and you can find ignorant masses to nod along to your nonsense. That's it for this video. Please share and subscribe and follow me on social media. The links are in the description below. Until next time, adios.